Section thirty one of Pantrothian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pantrothian by Alexis Sawyer. Repasts. Mortals were formerly remarkably sober, and the gods themselves set them the example by feeding exclusively on ambrosia and nectar the most illustrious warriors in the homeric ages were generally contented with a piece of roast beef for a festival or a wedding dinner the frugal fare was a piece of roast beef and the king of kings the pompous agamemnon offered no greater rarity to the august chiefs of greece assembled round his hospitable table it is true that the guest to be most honoured received for his own share an entire fillet of beef the vigorous but uncultivated appetites of these heroes were hardly satisfied when everything disappeared and none of them thought to prolong the pleasures of good cheer happy times of ingenious and ignorant frugality what has become of you it must not however be imagined that they were entirely destitute of more refined elements homer gives to the hellespont the epithet of fishy ithaca and several other islands of greece abounded in excellent game but the magiric genius was asleep it awoke at a later period beware however of a mistake those men with so little choice respecting their viands all possess stomachs of astounding capacity theagenes an athlete of thassos ate a whole bull milo of crotona did the same thing at least once Titormus had an ox served for supper and when he rose from table they say not a morsel remained astydamus of miletus invited to supper by the persian ariobarzanes devoured a feast prepared for nine persons cambus king of lydia had such an unfortunate appetite that one night the glutton devoured his wife Thais, king of the Paphlagonians, was afflicted with voracity nearly similar. The Persian, Cantibaris, ate so much and so long that his jaws were at last tired, and then attentive servants used to press the food into his mouth. These are the facts of which we do not exactly guarantee the truth, for history, it is no secret has some little resemblance to the microscope it frequently magnifies objects by presenting them to us through its deceitful prism we close this singularly incomplete list of the ancient polyphagists by adding that the pharsalians and the thessalians were redoubtable eaters and that the egyptians consumed a prodigious quantity of bread in more modern times some men have acquired by the energy of their hunger an illustration they would have vainly demanded from their genius or their virtues the emperor claudius sat down to table at all hours and in any place one day when he was dispensing justice according to his own fashion in the market-place of augustus his olfactory nerves scented the delicious odour of a feast which exhaled from one of the neighbouring temples it was the priests of mars who were merry-making at the expense of the good souls in the surrounding locality the glutton emperor immediately left his judgment seat and without any further ceremony went and asked them for a knife and fork never no never adds the biographer of this prince did he leave a repast until he was distended with food and soaked with drink and then only to sleep 
yes the ignoble caesar slept but still the peacock's feather an unseemly invention of roman turpitude was called into requisition to prepare the monarch for new excesses galba could taste nothing if he was not served with inconceivable profusion his stomach imposed limits upon him but his eyes knew none and when he had gloated to his heart's content upon the magnificent spectacle of innumerable viands for which the universe had been ransacked he would have the imperial dessert taken slowly round the table and then heaped up to a prodigious height before the astonished guests vitellius the boldest liver perhaps of the whole imperial crew and the most active polyphagist of past times caused himself to be invited the same day to several senatorial families this deplorable honour often caused their ruin for each repast cost not less than four hundred thousand sesterces or three thousand two hundred pounds the intrepid vitellius was equal to the whole thanks to the peacock's feather which doubtless was cursed more than once by the unfortunate victims of his dreadful gluttony true this poor prince was continually tormented with a hunger that no element seemed capable of satisfying in the sacrifices like the harpies of whom virgil speaks he took the half-roasted viands from the altars and disputed the sacred cakes with the gods as he passed through the streets he seized the smoking hot food spread out before the shops and public houses he did not even disdain the disgusting scraps that a miserable plebeian had gnawed the evening before and which a hunger-stricken slave would have hardly contested with him such were the masters of the world the proud caesars before whom haughty rome bowed the head and trembled and from whom it basely implored a smile up to that day when some soldiers tired of their shameful obedience kicked the imperial corpse into the tiber after having mutilated it in presence of the populace who crowded joyously around the gemonii these terrific examples of insatiable veracity have become rare and obscure a few isolated facts may perhaps be met with at very distant periods which remind us of the polyphagic celebrities of greece and italy there are however two which would have merited the attention of vitellius himself the ingenious fuller speaks of a man named nicholas wood to whom the county of kent proudly claims the honour of having given birth who once ate a whole sheep at one meal one day three dozen of pigeons were placed before him of which he left only the bones another day being at lord wootton's and having a good appetite he devoured eighty-four rabbits and eighteen yards of black pudding for his breakfast we leave to fuller the responsibility of the figures anyhow the brave nicholas wood must have been a vigorous trencherman the second anecdote is from Bershu. marshal villers had a house porter who was an enormous eater franz said he one day tell me now how many loins could you eat ah my lord as for loins not many five or six at most and how many legs of mutton ah as for legs of mutton not many seven or eight perhaps and fatted pullets ah as for pullets my lord not many not more than a dozen and pigeons ah as for pigeons not many perhaps forty fifty at most according to the appetite and larks ah as for that my lord little larks for ever my lord 
for ever a truce to gluttons let us speak of epicureans it is to them that gastronomic civilization owes the laws by which it is regulated they were the legislators of the table they introduced regularity and order at repasts the breakfast dinner collation and supper were created by those sages fashion has often modified the nomenclature but assuredly it will never be able to supersede it the greeks submitted to it for many years and then that fickle people whom everything wearied declined the drudgery of masticating so frequently the lower orders and the army ate twice a day the fashionable people contented themselves with one repast which some had served at midday but the greater part just before sunset the party of resistance had as yet yielded only on one point the collation and they continued bravely to breakfast dine and sup but the monophagists were not sparing in their jokes and the new fashion triumphed at last over the prescription of ancient usages pagan sobriety was doubtless far from suspecting that the book of ecclesiastes in accordance with it on this subject pronounces an anathema against the kingdom whose princes eat in the morning the greek manners were introduced in rome and persons of a certain rank who did not make a profession of gluttony gave themselves up to the pleasures of the table only once a day the tyranny of fashion was not however such that all persons thought themselves bound to obey it under pain of being shamed and ridiculed many unscrupulously transgressed its laws and more than one respectable greek of good family following the example of ulysses who prepared his breakfast at sunrise had the acratism brought so soon as the crowing of the cock announced the return of day this frugal breakfast was composed of bread steeped in pure wine the adults restricted themselves to this slight repast but the children received more substantial nourishment the romans when they were not asleep breakfasted at three or four o'clock in the morning a little bread and cheese or dried fruits enabled them to wait for the solemn hour of the banquets it would appear that the jews dined at midday it was the hour at which st peter was hungry this repast took place also among the greeks about the middle of the day if we are to believe athenaeus however cicero relates that the philosopher plato appeared to be very much astonished when travelling in italy to see the inhabitants eat twice every day it will only be necessary to repeat that the supper alone formed the rule and that the breakfast and dinner were exceptions they depended entirely upon the casualties of will about midday the sober romans had a slight collation seneca who never loses sight of himself in his fastidious treatises on wisdom informs us that a little bread and a few figs were all that his virtue required the senators the knights and the luxurious freedmen spared no expense either for dinner or supper the priests of mars of whom we have already spoken set them an example too seductive for them not to follow it it is to be remarked by the way that those worthy ministers of the god of war took this repast in the most secret part of their temple where they hardly allowed any one to come and interrupt them this gastronomic quietude was also very much the taste of a celebrated modern sailor the bailiff de suffren he was at dinner in acom india when a deputation from the town was announced being a witty glutton 
he conceived the happy thought of sending word to the importunate troop that an article of the christian religion expressly prohibited every christian from occupying himself with anything besides eating that function being of the most serious importance this reply singularly edified the deputation who retired with respect admiring the extreme devotion of the french general the collation merenda was little in use it took place about the end of the day before supper particularly in summer among the workmen and farm labourers we now come to the principal repast to that which threw such brilliancy over the latter centuries of rome when a culinary monomania a sort of gastronomic furore seems to have seized the sovereign people who no longer great by their conquests betrayed a desire to become so by the number and audacity of their follies the hebrews supped at the ninth hour that is to say about three o'clock in the afternoon their custom of two repasts would be sufficiently proved by the fact that on fast days they took food only in the evening hence when they did not fast they also ate at another hour their ordinary aliment was very simple we shall have to speak of it hereafter in the primitive times kings prepared their own suppers beef mutton goat's flesh such were the viands which then satisfied the daintiest palates baskets filled with pure wheaten bread were carried round to the guests and heaps of salt placed on the table gave proof of the hospitality of those simple and unsophisticated ages the fierce warriors of that warlike period never forgot to invoke the gods before they satisfied their appetites libations of wine rendered them favourable this pious duty once fulfilled they gave themselves up without restraint to the joys of good cheer and the sounds of the lyre and the buffooneries of mountebanks enlivened the banquet which again received fresh animation from the copious healths which persons the least burst in the forms of society never forgot it often happened that each one paid his share or brought provisions with him to these joyous suppers of which the last rays of the setting sun always gave the periodical signal the uncertainty of these amicable meetings constituted their charm picnics as we see may be traced rather far back it was then that pleasure presided at those repasts dullness had its turn when luxury proscribed the supper in open air and in common after the manner of the jews who assembled in gardens or under trees and mingled the sweet harmony of music with the less delicate seductions of their banquets the breakfast has always taken place after rising dinner in the middle of the day the collation in the course of the afternoon and the supper in the evening in the fourteenth century people dined at ten o'clock in the morning one or two centuries later they dined at eleven o'clock in the sixteenth century and at the commencement of the seventeenth they dined at midday in the best houses louis the fourteenth himself always sat down to table at that hour this order was not modified until the eighteenth century the sicilian cooks taught unheard of refinements and were sought after with strange eagerness the chine of beef and haunch of mutton of the homeric epoch gave way to sumptuous banquets and a learned prodigality divided them into two or three acts or courses the order and luxurious majesty of which have been adopted in modern times it appears that three or four o'clock in the afternoon the ninth hour 
was the time invariably fixed for the supper of the romans like the greeks of yore they contented themselves at first with simple aliments and few in number subsequently three courses sometimes seven or even more appeared to them to be hardly sufficient to satisfy the ardent voracity of their eyes and glut stomachs which odious precautions assimilated to the buckets of danaeus's daughters these suppers the details of which always appear to us bearing the impress of exaggeration notwithstanding the authority of the writers who furnished them were insufficient for certain prodigies of extravagance and furious gluttony who were served at midnight with a sort of wake commissatio at which some of them gave proof of renewed greed and vigour vitellius was renowned for this kind of nocturnal debauchery others shone in the second rank but no one equalled that monarch cook who made the empire a market and his shameful reign an unceasing banquet sensual enjoyments and every variety of barbarity that follows in their train were carried to the highest pitch there was something vast and monstrous of which nothing can give us an idea in the eclipse of mind and the depravity of their hearts all that force of intelligence and will which under the influence of christian spiritualism has revealed itself in modern times by so many chivalric inspirations so many moral institutions so many scientific discoveries so many industrial works then engulfed in the senses was taxed solely for their gratification the sensual organization of man had acquired a development apparently as vast as that of intelligence because intelligence had become the handmaid of the senses hence those colossal proportions in the tastes the banquets the pleasures of the ancients when compared with ours which make us regard them as an extinct race of giants if we consider them in a sensual point of view and as a race of pygmies if we measure them by that power of ideas that metaphysical and moral elevation to which we have attained and which would make a child of our days the catechist of all the philosophers of antiquity down to the time of the conquest of the north of europe by the romans the food was very simple chopped herbs boiled in cauldrons served in wooden bowls on the hide of an ox spread on the ground in the midst of the forest balls composed of different kinds of flour and some strips of meat grilled on the embers such was the food of our forefathers the table at which the anglo-saxons took their repasts was covered with a very clean cloth each one received a horn cup which contained some kind of pottage or ale the beverage for which they had a predilection the plates with which strutt has enriched his work give a satisfactory idea of the culinary intelligence of the nation they had spits knives plates and dishes in abundance england was marching with giant strides towards civilization the anglo-saxons were particularly fond of boiled meat they cut up the animal they intended to cook put the pieces into a cauldron supported by a tripod and then lighted a fire on the ground they stirred their ragout incessantly with a long two-pronged fork which also served them to take out the meat when it was done all the deplorable excesses of the romans ought not to divert us from the fact that religion and sound policy seem to have consecrated repasts in common as one of the means best calculated to unite men more closely in the bonds of concord and friendship the scriptures furnish us with the first examples among the israelites the banquets which followed the sacrifices 
always took place in an assembly of relations neighbours or friends they eat together and in public on wedding days and solemn festivals the first christians promptly adopted this custom their love feasts their agape were served in the church after the communion the rich contributed to them abundantly the poor according to their means and the indigent who presented themselves with nothing in their hands were received and treated as brethren admirable association of penury and opulence which will never be replaced by the crude utopias of modern philanthropy as an act of justice to pagan legislators we are compelled to say that sometimes they had excellent views which go far to extenuate many of their aberrations the laws of minos prescribed to the cretans the annual levy of an impost the half of which was to be consecrated to the nourishment of the people no one could eat alone a certain number of families met together to take their repasts in common at lacedaemon each one brought his share of the provisions necessary for the supper of the whole or he sent at the commencement of the month to the steward of the common halls wine cheese figs a measure of flour and a small sum of money to defray other expenses friendship sobriety and concord presided without exception at these meetings solon decreed that the athenians should assemble at the prytonea to eat together sometimes one sometimes another at the public expense each was invited in his turn and was expected to be there on the day named the prytonea of athens megara olympia and syzica contained a great number of porticoes under which were the tables at which the citizens sat the founder of rome also had the wisdom to ordain that in certain cases the inhabitants of the same ward should take their repasts in common as a sign of peace and good feeling nay more he decreed these suppers to be a part of the religious worship and they were called sacred banquets man abuses everything the romans tired of eating merely to support life and disdaining little by little that austere sobriety which rendered them the masters of the world gave themselves up at last to unbridled luxury which appears to have redoubled during the war of italy and the civil wars of marius in eighty three b c cornelius Silla assumed the government and one of the terrible dictator's laws lex cornelia renewed the ancient sumptuary regulations and fixed the prices of provisions julius caesar also made great efforts to oppose the redoubtable invasions of roman gastronomy that prince stationed guards in the markets with orders to seize whatever they found there in contravention of the laws if through want of vigilance or fidelity they allowed anything to escape it was sure to be confiscated by more active agents on the very tables and in presence of the assembled guests resistance only increased the evil augustus thought to render the laws more efficacious by modifying them he permitted twelve persons to meet in honour of the twelve great gods and to spend eight shillings in ordinary repasts twelve shillings in the banquets of the calends the ides and the nones and even two pounds on wedding days and the day following tiberius granted still more under his reign a worthy citizen might spend for supper the sum of four pounds without having to fear that any one would find fault with it caligula claudius and nero doubtless better judges of liberty than their predecessors allowed every one the right to ruin himself as joyously as he pleased 
these good princes so far from repressing the luxury of the table strove to fortify it with the authority of their examples vitellius was by nature a non-reformer that voracious caesar operated on a large scale he spent in four months for his suppers a little more than five million sterling a trifle for a roman emperor did not the riches and labour of europe asia and africa form his civil list it is quite true that out of this modest revenue he had to find corn to stop the cravings of the proletarians and provide the games of the circus in order to amuse them in their dangerous idleness but vitellius who had no other passion than that of good cheer was royally equal to the task and these things cause no surprise when we remember that a roman general lucullus spent not less than one thousand pounds to offer a little collation to two of his friends who refused him the time he required to treat them in a less unceremonious manner we find in the history of jack of newbury instructions relative to the manner in which an english tradesman was to feed the persons in his employment in the sixteenth century which would certainly not be very pleasing now to that useful and laborious class you feed your folks with the best of beef and the finest of wheat which is an oversight neither do i hear of any knight in this country that doth it and to say the truth how were they able to bear that part which they do if they saved it not by some means come thither and i warrant you that you shall see brown bread upon the board if it be of wheat and rye mingled together it is a great matter and bread most highly commended but most commonly they eat barley bread or rye mingled with peason or such like coarse grain which is doubtless of small price and there is no other bread allowed except it be at their own board and in like manner for their meat it is well known that necks and points of beef is their ordinary fare which because it is commonly lean they seeth therewith now and then a piece of bacon or pork whereby they make their pottage fat and therewith drive out the rest with more content and this you must do and besides that the midriffs of oxen and the cheeks the sheep's head and the gathers which you give away at your gate might serve them well enough this would be a great sparing to your meat and by this means you would save much money in the year whereby you might better maintain your french hood and silk gown the following is the style of living at the court of the dauphin of france in the fourteenth century as in all well-regulated houses there were five repasts namely the morning except on fast days the breakfast the repast of ten o'clock deceurs or decimer by abbreviation decima and by a second abbreviation dina the dinner the second dinner the supper or super at which they eat no more soup than we do and lastly the night repast which they call a collation as an everyday fare the dauphin took for his dinner a rice pottage with leeks or cabbage a piece of beef another of salt pork a dish of six hens or twelve pullets divided in two a piece of roast pork cheese and fruit at supper a piece of roast beef a dish of brains neat's feet with vinegar cheese and fruit other days other dishes which were also prearranged with respect to kind and quantity the barons of the court had always the half of the quantity of the dauphin the knights the quarter the equerries and chaplains the eighth the distributions of wine and bread were made in the same proportions such a rank such weight such measure 
so that the young and delicate baroness had four pots of wine while the chorister and the chaplain had but one we are indebted to the learned montiel for the following details relative to the public repast of louis the fourteenth the usher of the court at the hour named goes and knocks with his wand at the door of the hall of the bodyguard and says gentlemen to the king's table a guard is dispatched who follow him to the goblet where one of the officers for the service of the table takes the knave the guard accompany him marching by his side sword in hand having arrived at the dining-room the officers spread the cloth try the napkins the fork the spoon the knife and the toothpicks that is to say they touch them with a morsel of bread which they afterwards eat the usher returns again to the hall of the bodyguard knocks at the door with his wand and cries gentlemen the king's meat four guards then follow him to the ambry where the equerry of the household and the chief steward or major domo test the dishes by dipping a piece of bread which they eat after this the king's meat is carried the guards marching with their drawn swords on either side the chief steward preceded by the usher walking in front when he arrives near the table he approaches the knave and makes his obeisance to it and if the announcer or any other person desire also to do it he may the gentlemen in waiting place the dishes successively and the table being covered with them the king then enters it is to be remarked that it is always a prince or a great personage who presents the wet napkin to him with which to wash his hands whereas it is a simple valet who presents him with a dry napkin to wipe them the king takes his seat the equerry carver carves the viands the king serves himself on a plate of gold when he asks for a drink the cupbearer calls aloud drink for the king at the same time he makes his obeisance to him goes to the buffet takes two crystal decanters one of which is filled with wine and the other with water returns to the king makes another obeisance removes the cover of the glass and presents it to the king who pours out wine and water according to his own pleasure during the dinner or supper of the king a group of lordly courtiers stand behind his chair and endeavour though frequently in vain to divert him and make him laugh and another group composed of ladies of the court stand behind the queen's chair who on their part try to amuse her and excite a smile whether the king ate in public or private the table is always served in the same manner at dinner two large tureens of soup two middling sized ones two small ones as side dishes first course two large dishes two middling sized ones six small ones as side dishes second course two large dishes of roast two more as side dishes at supper the same number of dishes only there is but three-fourths of the quantity of soup the king eats only with the royal family and princes of the blood sometimes however the pope's nuncio has the honour of sitting at his table but always at the distance of four places the luxury of the table was carried so far under edward the third of england that the prince was constrained in the seventeenth year of his reign to impose sumptuary laws on his subjects forbidding the common people the indulgence of costly food and fine wines the necessity for this measure is demonstrated by the fact of which we read in the chronicles of stowe that at the marriage of lionel duke of clarence the third son of edward the third with violentus 
the daughter of galesius the second duke of milan there was a rich feast in which above thirty courses were served at the table and the fragments that remained were more than sufficient to have served a thousand people the same chronicler also informs us that king richard the second held the christmas feasts in the great hall of westminster in thirteen ninety nine and such numbers came that every day there were slain twenty six or twenty eight oxen and three hundred sheep besides fowls without number richard neville earl of warwick kept so good a table that his guests often ate six fat oxen for their breakfast in number of dishes and change of meat says hollinshead the nobility of england do most exceed sith there is no day in manner that passeth over their heads wherein they have not only beef mutton veal lamb kid pork coney capon pig or so many of these as the season yieldeth but also some portion of the red or fallow deer beside great variety of fish and wild fowl and thereto sundry other delicates wherein the sweet hand of the portingale is not wanting so early as the sixteenth century the inhabitants of the city of london were remarkable for the astonishing profusion of their repasts if we are to believe the poet massinger men may talk of country christmas and court gluttony their thirty pounds for buttered eggs their pies of carp's tongues their pheasants drenched with ambergris the carcasses of three fat weathers bruised for gravy to make sauce for a single peacock yet their feasts were farce compared with the cities the description of one dish will enable us to judge of the others three sucking pigs served up in a dish took from the sow as soon as she had farrowed a fortnight fed with dates and muscadine that stood my master in twenty marks apiece besides the puddings in their bellies made of i know not what hang thyself voluptuous apicius thou hast never dreamed of such delicate fare in the comedy of the parson's wedding the captain orders for his supper chines fried and the salmon carved a carp and black sauce red deer in the blood and an assembly of woodcocks and jacksnipes so fat you would think that they had their winding sheets on and upon these as their pages let me have weight your sussex wheat ear with a feather in his cap over all which let our countrymen general chine of beef command i hate your french pottage that looks as if the cookmaid had more hand in it than the cook the luxurious munificence of norman kings is almost as remarkable as that of the emperors of degenerate rome william the conqueror had himself crowned three times in the same year and the banquets he gave on those occasions were such that they impoverished the kingdom at the dinner given on the marriage of richard earl of cornwall and brother of henry the third with the daughter of raymond earl of provence more than thirty thousand dishes were served on the table of the bride and bridegroom in the year twelve fifty two john mansell the king's counsellor gave a stately dinner to the kings of england and scotland and their queens there was also present edward the king's son the bishop of london and many earls barons knights and citizens in short so large was his company that his house at tothill could not contain them therefore he set up tents and pavilions for their reception seven hundred messes of meat was not sufficient to serve them for the first course the following details which we borrow from monteil's excellent work give us some idea of the style of living in the mansions of france during the fourteenth century whenever there is a dinner of ceremony the clerks of the church are requested to bring holy water the repast is commenced and concluded with fruit 
the bread eaten is in loaves of nine ounces only every basin of meat is surrounded with sage lavender or other aromatic herbs and on sunday or any holiday negus is given the sideboard or buffet is always in the middle of the room covered with jugs and large drinking cups of gold and silver the cellars storerooms kneading troughs dairies and fruit stores are filled and emptied unceasingly take who will when he will and as much as he will provisions of every kind are heaped up with a profusion that announces magnificence allied with riches the great number of nobles knights huntsmen falconers pages kitchen servants butlers bakers the numerous valets workmen gardeners harbingers doorkeepers porters and guards are not equal to the task of consuming so much from all sides come relations allies neighbours friends pilgrims and travellers all of whom remain or depart at will being feasted as if it were the morrow of a wedding or a patronal festivity the kitchen chimney places are not less than twelve feet in width one man would not have strength sufficient to use the tongs or the shovels the andirons do not weigh less than a hundred pounds the trivets forty pounds copper saucepans of thirty pounds are common and so are spits of eleven and twelve pounds one roast is composed of one two or three calves two three or four sheep besides game venison and poultry the boiling of the saucepans the exhalations from the grease render the atmosphere so fat so thick that it is only necessary to breathe in it to feed a person would not dare enter one of those kitchens on the eve of a feast day for fear as it were of breaking his fast in the sixteenth century persons washed their hands at the commencement of a repast and a second time when it was concluded when the master of the house was particular on the point of civility he had a basin sent round at this second ablution filled with perfumed water when the person seated in the chief place was a guest of distinction politeness made it indispensable to present him with water to rinse his mouth one of the most difficult points of french civility in the sixteenth century was to drink to a person's health or return the compliment in a proper manner a guest at one end of the table held up his glass and called out mr such a one to your health he replied i love it from you during the whole of the repast healths were bandied to and fro in every sense at the end they touched glasses together at a central point which created a very singular kind of clash and at the same time the arms underneath formed a sort of faces of sleeves and cuffs end of section thirty one section thirty two of pantrophion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c pantrophion by alexis soyer variety of repasts the fertile country inhabited by the jewish people furnished them with a great variety of excellent provisions those of which they made the greatest consumption and which we find generally mentioned in the scriptures are bread flour barley beans lentils wine raisins figs honey butter oil sheep oxen fatted calves etc the fat of animals offered in sacrifice was reserved for the lord but with this exception the hebrews could 
freely make use of it they esteemed it much and when they wished to speak of a rich banquet they called it a banquet of fat animals he that loveth wine and oil says solomon shall not be rich the extreme simplicity of the greater part of the biblical repasts ought not to induce us to suppose that the jews were entire strangers to the inspirations of good cheer solomon's provisions for one day were thirty measures of fine flour and threescore measures of meal ten fat oxen and twenty oxen out of the pastures and a hundred sheep besides harts roebucks and fallow deer and fatted fowl that primitive nation also knew different kinds of banquets which conformly with their naive manners were associated with the celebration of a religious solemnity a sad or a joyful event a family festivity or mourning a victory or a public calamity the greeks and romans skilful masters in the art of good living were early on the alert to assure the collection of all things necessary for the support of life take care said aurelian to flavius take care above all things that the markets of rome be well supplied nothing more gay or more peaceful than the people when they are well fed this remark is much more profound than it at first appears at athens special officers visited the markets and only permitted each citizen to purchase and keep his own house the quantity of provisions necessary for one year the ediles of rome performed nearly similar functions the prefect of the town was invested with the power of making regulations for the markets and the prefect of provisions had the inspection of the sale of bread meat wine fish and all other kinds of ailment required either for the table of the rich or poor plebeian during a long time in greece and italy the only charm of repast was that they furnished an opportunity for the exercise of those duties of kind hospitality which apollodorus has described in the following ingenious style as soon as a friend says he steps on the threshold of his host the porter receives him with a smiling face the dog of the house comes immediately to caress him amiably wagging his tail then some one runs and presents him a seat without being told this last trait is charming but afterwards they thought much more of honoring the god of good cheer than jupiter hops and joyous comus became everywhere the fashionable divinity one of the ancients describes him in the following manner he is seen at the door of an apartment communicating with the banqueting hall his smiling face is fresh plump and ruddy his head is crowned with roses and he sleeps standing his left hand rests on a thyrus but sleep makes him lose his hold he staggers and the torch will soon fall from his grasp the greeks were fervent in their worship of this god an epoch when rome still prided herself on her transcendent sobriety canon gave a banquet to all the athenians after the battle of synodos about four centuries before the christian era and his celebrated contemporary the handsome alcibiades conqueror in the olympic games magnificently regaled the numerous spectators who had just applauded his triumph the pagan temples themselves often rung with the sound of the music the chants and the dances which always accompanied the religious banquets these feasts in honor of the immortals must have been rather unedifying 
to the truly faithful, for gaiety generally degenerated into extreme licentiousness. The conquest of Asia was fatal to the Romans. Their savage rudeness yielded to the effeminate manners of the vanquished, and henceforth the Epicureans of Italy studied but one thing, gastronomic delectation, had but one worship, that of the goddess Ventura, protectress of food and sovereign of the table. Luxury made appalling progress. Nearly a century B.C., the Romans did not blush to give fifty denarii, one pound sixteen shillings, for a young fatted peacock, three denarii at least, more than two shillings, for a thrush, and a century later, four thousand sesterces, thirty-six pounds, were given for a couple of fine young pigeons. Worse followed. Senka describes in a few words the luxury of the table among the voluptuous Romans. Behold, says he, Nomatus and Apicius, these happy conquerors of all that is delectable on earth or in the sea. Behold them at table, stretched on their couches and contemplating innumerable viands. Harmonious songs flatter their ears, a variety of pleasing objects occupy their eyes, and the most exquisite savours captivate their insatiable palates. The genius of gluttony multiplied the banquets by prescribing luxurious gastronomic assemblages, sometimes in honour of the gods, and often for the gratification of simple mortals themselves. Each year, at the Ides of November, a repast was offered to Jupiter in the capital, Kenya Capolina, the statue of God was present at the banquet, reclining on a magnificent couch, with Juno and Minerva seated on either side. These divinities were splendidly served, and, as they touched nothing, in the middle of the night the seven epluri priests joyously eat the supper of the three immortals. The cereal banquet, Cana Cerealis, was equally splendid, and Ceres maintained the same frugality. A sterile reminiscence of the equality which reigned among men in the golden age placed the slaves at table by the side of their masters during the celebration of the Saturnella Cana Saturnilis this usage was common to the greeks and romans the ninth day of the august calendus and the thirteenth day of the november calendus a gastronomic solemnity a monstrous gala brought together the roman pontiffs to celebrate the day of their inauguration cana pontificalis this banquet was worthy of the proverbial delicacy of those sacred stomachs. The augurs treated themselves magnificently in their turn, cana augurilis, when they entered on their functions. Pagan priests of Rome vied one with another in a noble emulation of exquisite refinement and ruinous viands, but it is said that the ministers of Mars, who had the reputation of being arch epicureans cana salarius always won the palm in this struggle of magnificence and voluptuousness the day the emperor took the title of augustus he gave a supper carna imperatoria to the senators and magistrates the tribute of a year were sometimes hardly sufficient to indemnify the grand master of these imperial orgies the triumphal banquets carna triumphalis were less elegant no doubt but they cost the victor who invited the people immense sums the guests crowded into the vast enclosure of the temple of jupiter capitolinus or the temple of hercules 
they sat down to table to celebrate the anniversary of a birthday cana natalia the happy wedding day cana nuptialis the arrival of a friend cana adventalia the sad day of his departure cana vatica the melancholy ceremony of interment was followed by a supper cana funeribus at which the guests were the relations and friends of the deceased they drank to his manes and by decrees the wine was not only stifled their laments but called forth joyous smiles the romans have bequeathed to certain modern nations more than the remembrance of their funeral repasts in the palmy days of athens the greeks evinced more of the epicurean than the glutton a fact which may be inferred by the description of the supper of Deneus. the most magnificent of their repasts was perhaps that which alexander the greek had served to ten thousand guests who received each one a present of a golden patera in greece as in rome the greater part of the events of life occasioned the joyous meeting of relations and friends at the birth of a child a banquet was given in his honour he was named on the tenth day and the ceremony terminated with a banquet in which they offered the guests cooked cherso cheese cabbage boiled in oil pigeons thrushes fish and brimming cups of excellent wine the teething repast took place when the child had attained his seventh month and the weaning supper when he began to eat these family feasts more or less sumptuous according to the fortune and rank of the individuals who gave them were generally signalized by a custom which ridiculous and egotistical vanity could alone authorize and maintain on the banquet day care was taken to throw the feathers of the poultry before the door of the house in order to excite the fruitless greed of the poor wretches who as they passed prayed heartily that the infernal divinities might take the proud amphitryon his guests and even the meanest of his servants in france about thirteen fifty the setier about twelve english bushels of wheat was worth zero wheat was worth seven pennies rye three pennies beans five pennies peas six pennies a hogshead of wine four shillings seven pennies a load of hay one shilling ten pennies an ox six shillings ten pennies a horse eleven shillings six pennies a calf one shilling two pennies a sheep four pennies a fat pig two shillings a gosling one penny a hen three quarters of a penny one hundred eggs one and a half pennies one pound of butter three and a half pennies one pound of honey ten and a half pennies one pound of wax one shilling ten pennies prices of a few articles in france during the fifteenth century one pound of bread a quarter penny one pint of wine one quarter penny a pint of mustard three quarters of a penny a bushel of salt two and a half pennies one pound of pepper two pennies one pound of cinnamon one shilling two pennies one pound of bacon three quarters of a penny a pair of pigeons one and a quarter pennies a pair of partridges two and a half pennies a cart load of wood un voy eight pennies a sack of charcoal one penny one pound of candles one half penny in england under the reign of edward the third 
a royal proclamation fixed the price of the following articles a swan four pennies a port cell eight pennies an ewe six pennies a capon six pennies a hen four pennies a pullet two and a half pennies a pusselin two pennies a cooney four pennies a teal two pennies a river ballad five pennies a snipe one penny a woodcock three pennies a partridge five pennies a plover three pennies a pheasant one shilling four pennies twelve eggs one penny twelve small birds one penny the funeral repast of sir john redstone mayor of london who died in fifteen thirty one occasioned the following expenses sheep breed seven shillings five pennies seven pounds of sugar for the same four shillings one penny two ounces of saffron two shillings two ounces of cloves and mace one shilling eight pennies seven ounces of pepper ten and a half pennies sixty eggs seven and a half pennies seven dishes of butter at four and a half pennies the gallon three shillings three and a quarter pennies mancha breed one shilling four hundred of peers two shillings four pennies one pound of biscuits eight pennies to the pike monger sixteen pikes at one shilling four pennies apiece one pound one shilling and four pennies eight rounds of sturgeon one pound two shillings to the poulter six rounds of brawn eleven shillings eight pennies ten swans at six shillings apiece three pounds two dozen of quails ten shillings three dozen of rabbits six shillings six pennies twenty-two capons twelve shillings ten pennies nine dozen of pygons at ten pennies per dozen seven shillings six pennies four geese two shillings eight pennies three hundred eggs three shillings nine pennies to the boucher a sirloin of beef two shillings four pennies half a veal calf two shillings eight pennies four merry bones eight pennies to the milk wife two gallons and six dishes of butter four shillings two pennies eight gallons of cream four shillings twelve gallons of curdle one shilling six pennies to the brewer three barrels of ale eleven shillings a kilderkin of beer one shilling four double beer to the table four pennies yeast four pennies to the vinter thirty-two gallons of red and claret wine at ten pennies per gallon one pound six shillings eight pennies three gallons of macaray four pennies a rundlet of muscadine six shillings one pound of bread one quarter of a penny the grocer six ounces of pepper nine pennies four ounces of cloves and mace two shillings four pennies two ounces of saffron one shilling ten pennies eighteen pounds of prunes three shillings eight pounds of corns one shilling eight pennies six pounds of dates two shillings eleven pounds of biscuits ten pennies twelve pounds of sugar seven shillings 
five ounces of cinnamon one shilling three pennies four ounces of ginger six pennies the baker four bushels of chet at one shilling ten pennies the bushel seven shillings four pennies for hot bread four shillings for fine flour ten pennies for bastard flour one shilling ten pennies the chandelier a pack and a half of salt six pennies for candles four pennies for vinegar four pennies for verges six pennies for pack thread and mustard two pennies for capies capers two pennies for lop of pots eight pennies for hired of pots four pennies the cook for his labor and company for eighteen messes of meat fifteen shillings for your bees eight pennies a quarter of a hundred of fagots one shilling two pennies for coals one shilling six pennies paid the turners of brioches and scaldons for them one shilling four pennies the following is a correct copy of a monster bill of fare from a paper found in the tower of london three hundred quarters of wheat three hundred turns of ale one hundred and four turns of wine one pipe of spiced wine ten fat oxen six wild bulls three hundred pigs one hundred one thousand and four weathers three hundred hogs three thousand calves three hundred capons one hundred peacocks two hundred cranes two hundred kids two thousand chickens four thousand pigeons four thousand rabbits four thousand ducks two hundred and four bitterns four hundred hernseys two hundred peasants five hundred partridges five thousand woodcocks four hundred plovers one hundred curlews one hundred quails one thousand agates two hundred rees four thousand bucks does and roebucks one hundred and fifty five hot venison pasties four thousand cold venison pasties one thousand dishes of jellies two thousand hot custards four thousand cold custards four hundred tarts three hundred pikes three hundred breams eight seals and four porpoises at the feast the earl of warwick was steward the earl of bedford treasurer the lord of hastings controller with many noble officers servitors one thousand cooks sixty two kitcheners and scullions five hundred and fifteen in france fourteenth and fifteenth centuries the repasts were commonly divided into five parts called courses or dishes the first course was composed of cherries tender fruits citrons and salads milk porridge puddings and potages followed it was the second course the third consisted of roast with various sauces the second roast or fourth course presented the guests with venison and game the fifth course took the name of fruit course at this they served tarts made with all sorts of herbs flowers grains vegetables and fruit End of section 32. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 33 of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Pantrophion by Alexis Soyer The Dining Room The Coecilium, dining room, properly so called, was the place in the upper part of the house 
where they eat. It was reached by a staircase, and thither persons repaired during the summer, particularly in the country. The Roman villas terminated by a platform, on which the Romans often collected at mealtime. The air was not so hot, and the panorama of the neighboring country seats was presented without obstruction to the gaze of the guests. The dining room was commonly decorated with fasces of arms and trophies, which served as a memento of the warlike virtues of the ancestors of the master of the house. Enchanting frescoes stood out marvelously from the obscure shading of the wall, round which were twined fresh garlands of flowers and a mosaic floor masterpiece of art and patience harmonized with the fascinating landscape of the ceiling the sight of which varied with every course the emperor nero who carried this taste for the beautiful rather too far devised a sort of vault in the most elegant style and entirely composed of movable leaves of ivory which exalted sweet perfumes and whence flowers fell on the guests in another of his dining rooms admiration was excited by a magnificent dome the rotary movement of which imitated day and night the course of the celestial bodies these prodigies of ancient mechanism adorned the palace that the prodigal caesar called the gilded house the colossal statue of that prince rose in the middle of the hall. It was a hundred and twenty feet high. Studious people, or those who wished to appear so, covered some part of the dining room with books, for it was a custom introduced into Rome to have recitations or readings during the repast. Atticus had always a reader, and Juvenal promises the friend he invites to supper that he shall hear some fragments from Virgil and Homer. The Greeks yielded willingly to this intellectual pastime at the commencement of the banquet, whilst incense and other perfumes filled the room with a light vapor. Opposite the entrance door stood a buffet, sometimes of iron, but more generally among the Greeks, of sculptured wood, bronze, or silver, on which were represented the heads of oxen or satyrs. This piece of furniture was placed under the protection of mercury, and a curtain commonly veiled the front of it. It served for the display of precious plate, vases of silver, silver gilt, and gold, enriched with magnificent precious stones. The buffet of the Romans, a sort of sideboard of rare workmanship, was appropriated to the same use. Sometimes a single foot supported a white marble table, surrounded with a border of vert antique, and plates and dishes were arranged on two elegant shelves placed above. Again, the artist frequently conceived the idea of giving a whimsical form to the buffet, which enhanced its price. It was a ship laden with the vases necessary for the banquet. Four enormous amphorae occupied the deck. On the two sides of the mast, towards the prow, was a candelabrium, and at the stern was displayed a large-bellied canthras, or vase, with mobile handles. The main topmast was replaced by a large urn, and two cups of bacchus, were gracefully balanced at either extremity of the yard, along which were suspended craters, or vases, used in drinking wine. The buffet of the Greeks and Romans survived the ruins of those two celebrated nations. We find it again in the Middle Ages, and even more in modern times. Then also rich people loved to display their plate on a very apparent piece of furniture, which, being dressed, took the name of dresser. Monsirlet, describing the magnificence of the Duke of Burgundy during his sojourn in Paris, relates that in the room of his mansion in which he eat was a square dresser, dressoir, with shelves. 
which dresser was covered and loaded with very rich gold and silver plate sovereigns who affected great magnificence had buffets of metal there were three one for silver one for silver gilt and one for gold at the banquet which the king of france charles v gave to the emperor charles the fourth his uncle each of the three buffets was of the same metal as the plate it supported after the birth of a child ladies when they received visits had a dresser placed in their room those of countesses and great ladies had three shelves those of the wives of the younger sons of baronets had two women well connected but not titled could have no shelf those who enjoyed the honors of the court placed by the side of the buffet a little table covered with a white cloth destined for the hippocras and spiced wine they offered their visitors and which they drank in hanaps or a kind of chalice of earthenware gold or silver those of crystal were much esteemed charles the bald gave to the abbey of st denis a hanap said to have belonged to solomon it was of pure gold fine emeralds fine garnets and the work so marvellous that in all the kingdom of the world never was there anything so perfect the great lords also indulged in metal dressers to which the sixteenth century gave the name of buffets under henry the second of france the court called them credence from an italian word bearing the same meaning and which they had retained the hebrews probably knew nothing of chimneys when king jehoiakim burned the book which jeremiah had written he sat in the winter house in the ninth month and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him when among the greeks or romans they wanted to warm the dining room they also had recourse to braziers or bronze furnaces of the dimension of a middling sized table resting on lion's claws foliage in copper bronze and silver was artistically encrusted round the edge the bottom was a very thick iron grating above and beneath brickwork prevented the coal from touching the upper part or escaping through the interstices. they also made use of two kinds of stoves to warm the dining room the one was concealed under ground in the massive wall and little pipes extended from its orifice to the apartment the other portative and light disappeared whenever it was judged expedient among the pagans the dining room was lighted by torches made of a resinous wood or tallow candles the rich headlamps candelabra or magnificent lustres suspended from the ceiling they even knew the luxury of wax candles in the middle ages sovereigns and the great lords had in the middle of their dining rooms fountains playing which poured forth wine hippocras and other liquors some gave rose water and divers undiferous liquids to perfume the banqueting hall rubicus found in tartay a parisian goldsmith guillaume boucher who had settled under the, the sway of the khan and had made him one of those fountains the municipal bodies adopted them at the entrance of charles the seventh into paris one of this kind was seen in the rue st denis one of the tubes spouted milk another vermilion colored wine another white wine and another pure water and persons stood all around with silver cups to give drink to the passer-by in the seventeenth century playing fountains was still used at repasts end of section thirty three Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 34 of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Pantrophion by Alexis Soyer. The Table, the Table Seats. It is pretended, says Athenius, that in the Homeric times each guest had a table to himself, on which he was served with a saddleback of beef or a whole sheep or goat. It was the custom among the heroes, all men of high lineage and tolerably aristocratic in their tastes. The burglars of those warlike times and the villains of the epoch ate their dinner without form or ceremony on a heap of grass which also served them as a seat or couch wooden tables at first very clumsy ones no doubt only came into use when the development of human industry had enabled men to understand that they might be preferable to a truss of hay a passage in homer would seem to show that they were very much like ours perhaps the circular form was generally preferred luxury soon called for the most precious metals and the greeks had at a very early period tables of bronze and even of fine silver the isle of rena produced magnificent ones and an expensive fashion caused those luxurious pieces of furniture to be prized when they presented delicate incrustations of silver bronze or ivory and rested on lion's claws or leopard's feet cenus mantelus introduced these rarities into rome after the conquest of asia he also was the originator of tables veneered with plates of gold which ere long adorned the dining-rooms of princes and senators and the excessive price of which only surpassed by that of tables made of precious woods from distant countries the maple the witten and a species of african lemon tree occupied the first rank and the prodigious skill of the workmen gave them a value superior to gold and silver the most beautiful of these tables were spotted or veined to imitate the tiger or panther's skin but they acquired an exorbitant claim upon the admiration of connoisseurs when they bore the marvellous design of a peacock's tail this fantastic play of nature commanded a boundless price an artist of unrivalled talent carvilius polio was the first according to pliny who enriched these magnificent woods with bulwark of ivory and shell in the acme of perfection under the reign of nero the romans dyed this shell and thought to increase its primitive value by giving it the tints and accidental shades of the cedar the maple and the lemon tree these splendid pieces of furniture were at first square then round then in the form of a half circle or half moon and this horseshoe shaped table they called a sigma from the name of that greek letter which resembled our c the guests whom any person wished to honour most were placed at the extremities of this hemicircle overlaid with magnificent covers which replaced the skins of beasts formerly used for their adornment and in addition they were spread with tissues of fine linen and rich stuffs elaborately worked the tables were changed at each course the greeks cleaned them with sponge the latins used a sort of thick plushed linen cloth the opulent the opulent citizens possessed a great number of tables some were ivory others of maple wood cedar of mount atlas or lemon cicero had one of this latter kind of wood which cost him twenty thousand sesterces about one thousand four hundred and eighty pounds they rested on one two or three feet and were called monopedes bipedes and tripedes 
the romans often changed tables only twice during the repast fish and flesh appeared on the first and the fruit was served on the second the same custom was common to the greeks and the oriental nations the hebrews had also two tables in their solemn feasts and sacrificial banquets on one was served the flesh of the victim and on the other they placed the cup of benediction which passed round from one to another and was called the cup of praise the luxury of rome seemed to revive after she had become extinct st remy bishop of rheims left to his heirs a silver table embellished with figures charlemagne had three made of the same metal the first represented the ancient capital of the world the second constantinople the third every known region of the earth amar viscount of limoges found on his estate a treasure which consisted of a table round which were seated an emperor his wife and several children all as large as life and of massive gold richard coeur de lion pretended that the treasure belonged to him as lord of limousin and went to lay siege to the castle of calons to which amar had retired where the king received a wound of which he died the sixth of april eleven ninety nine silver tables still existed in the seventeenth century madame de savine sixteen eighty nine speaking of persons who following the example of louis the fourteenth sent their plate to the mint says madame de chales has sent her table two gurdillons and her beautiful toilet of silver gilt at some distance from the sigma on a slightly raised platform were three kinds of elegant credences for the cups wines and vases the major domo himself generally attended to this part of the service a very curious old book cited by strutt the book of carivin contains the following instructions as to the manner of laying this cloth for the king of england serve your sovereign with wafers and pockress also lock your compost be fair and clean and your ale be days old before men drink it and be courteous of answer to each person and when ye lay the cloth wipe the border clean with the cloth then lay a cloth take your fellow that one end and hold you the other end then draw the cloth straight the bot on the outer edge lay the outer part and hang it even then take the third cloth and lay it bout on the inner edge and lay a stat with the upper part half a foot broad then cover thy cupboard and thine awry with the towel of the paper then take thy towel about thy neck and lay that on side of the towel upon thy left arm and thereon lay your sovereign's napkin and on thine arm seven loys of bread with thee or four trencher loves with the end of the towel in the left hand as the manner is then take thy salt cellar in thy left hand and take the end of the towel in your right hand to bear in spoons and knives then set your salt on the right side where your sovereigns shall sit and on the left side the salt set your treachores then lay your knives and set your bread one loaf by another your spoons and your napkins fay folder beside your bread then over your bread and treachores spoons and knives and at every end of the table set a salt cellar with two trencher loaves and if ye make your wrapper mannerly 
than take a towel of reins of two yards and a half and take the towel by the ends double and lay it on the table then take the ends of the bought a handful in your hands and wrap it hard and lay the end so wrapped between two towel upon that end so wrapped lays your bread bottom to bottom six or seven loaves then set your bread mannerly in form and when your sovereign's table is thus arrayed cover all other boards with salt trenchers and cups and say then uri be arrayed with basins and ewers and water hot and cold and see ye have napkins cups and spoons and see your pots for wine ale be made clean and to the surnap make curtsy with a cloth under a fair double napri then take the towel's end next you and the utter end of the cloth on the utter side of the table and hold these three ends at once and fold them at once that a plate pass not a fork broad then lay it as it should lay and after met wash with that that it at the right hand of the table ye must guide it out and the marshal must convey it and look on each cloth the right side be outward and draw its strength that must ye reese the upper part of the towel and lay it without only going and at every end of the towel ye must convey half a yard that the sewer may make reverently and let it be and when your sovereign hath washen draw the syrup even then bear the syrup to the midst of the board and take it up before your sovereign and bear it into the ewe again and when your sovereign is set lock your towel about your neck then make your sovereign curtsy then uncover your bread and set it by the salt and lay your napkin knife and spoon afore him then kneel on your knee till your purpane pass eight loaves and look ye see at your ends o the table four loaves at a mess and see that every person have napkin and spoon and weigh well to the server how many dishes be covered that so many cups cover ye then serve ye forth the table mannerly that every man may speak your curtsy the table seats the jews originally sat down to their meals but when they became subject to persia they laid on couches at their repasts like their conquerors and other oriental nations from which the greeks and romans borrowed their custom the most distinguished place was at the head of the table at the extremity of the room near the wall saul sat in this place of honor under the reign of solomon the hebrews still used seats the egyptians were early acquainted with the effeminate sumptuousness of table couches they often placed on them the venerated images of jupiter juno and the king himself before they had adopted this refinement of oriental luxury the greeks sat at their repasts on chairs more or less costly but all very elegant similar to those who which adorn our drawing-rooms and which have been modelled from theirs homer's heroes sat down to table and alexander the great appears to have preserved the custom that prince giving a repast to ten thousand persons caused all to be seated in silver armed chairs covered with purple however hessengander assures us that among the macedonians he who had succeeded in killing a wild boar 
reclined at full length whilst the other guests remained seated italy always imitated greece and like her had table couches which at first were only used by men a feeling of propriety interdicted their use by women but the relaxation of morals seconded by faction soon banished this seeming reserve and the two sexes could only eat in a reclining posture a round low table made of common wood and resting on three legs was placed in the dining-room of persons in humble life the rich had it made of lemon or maple wood and supported by a single ivory foot the three couches at most were arranged round this table triclinium sometimes two which platus names biclinium and these they covered with purple or other magnificent stuffs before they placed themselves the guests performed their ablutions and threw off their togas to substitute the dinner robe they then took off their sandals and lay down three or four on each couch the rules of good society did not allow that number to be exceeded the upper part of the body was supported by the left elbow the lower part was extended the head was slightly raised and downy little cushions supported the back when several persons occupied the same couch the first placed himself at the head in such a manner that his feet nearly reached the shoulders of the second guest whose head was before the middle of the body of the preceding one from whom he was separated by a cushion and his feet descended to the back of the third guest who followed the same order with respect to the fourth when a couch contained three persons the one in the middle occupied the place of honour when there were four that distinction belonged to the second the place at the head of the couch was only offered to the most worthy when not more than two persons were on the couch among the persians the middle place was reserved for the king cyrus placed on his left the guest to whom he wished to do the most honour the next on his right the third on his left the fourth on his right and so on down to the last in greece the most distinguished personage occupied the head of the table the voluptuous heliogabus only made use of couches stuffed with hairs down or partridges feathers the emperor ilias versus introduced a more exquisite novelty he had his filled with lily and rose leaves the first of these princes a cruel monarch or capricious child according to his strange whims amused himself sometimes by placing on a couch round the sigma at one time eight bald men at another eight gouty men one day eight grey-headed old men another day eight very fat men who were so crowded together that it was almost impossible for them to raise their hands to the mouth and the brainless dolt shook with laughter at their efforts and their contortions one of his favorite diversions consisted in filling a leathern table couch with air instead of wool and while the guests were engaged in drinking a tap concealed under the carpet was open unknown to them the couch sank and the drinkers rolled pell-mell under the sigma to the great delight of the beardless emperor who enjoyed greatly his espalieri the celts seated themselves at their repast on hay before very low tables the belgians reclined on kind of a couch the gauls on the skins of dogs or wolves these different authorities are easily reconciled for they relate to different cantons of gaul the use of couches was not unknown in the middle ages we find the proof of it in the fable of the thirteenth century we have also the description of a magnificent repast given by a bishop 
to two great officers of charlemagne at which the prelate was seated or lying on feather cushions but this fashion was unsuccessful and people preferred wooden seats and stools covered with carpet when they gave a great feast they seated the guests on benches banks whence came the word banquet henry the third of france introduced armchairs for himself and folding stools for his suite sometimes people eat on the floor st arnold bishop of soissons took his repasts in that manner on the day of the dedication of a church after having had carpets spread on the ground in the winter the banqueting place was spread with straw or hay and in summer with grass and leaves pelicans and tavern keepers decorated their rooms in like manner the gallantry of the middle ages has led to the adoption of a rather singular custom which consisted in placing the guests two and two man and woman and serving for each couple one common dish which they called eating in the same porringer neither had they more than one cup in families the same goblet served for all saint berlanda was disinherited by her father who was exasperated because under pretext that he was leprous she had washed his goblet before making use of it for herself a passage in martial would seem to imply that the guests among the romans laid the cloth themselves that is to say they spread on the sigma the stuff more or less precious with which it was then to be adorned a somewhat whimsical custom was established in the middle ages of chivalry when it was intended to affront any one a herald or king at arms was sent to cut the cloth before him and turn his bread upside down that was called cutting away the cloth and was practised in reference to cowards and faithless vassals it is thought that bertrand drudgelin was the originator of this custom mention is made of tablecloths in the life of saint alloy they were in use on common tables but the costly ones were not covered these cloths were plushed and shaggy as we find by the description of nicholas the author of a poem on louis de debonair they were va of vast dimensions in the inventory of certain effects in the monastery of fortenel in the ninth century we read of four tablecloths each of which measured twelve yards and a half by two and a half another twelve and a half by three and three quarters and thirteen three yards and three quarters wide in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries tablecloths were called in france doubliers doubtless because they were folded in two this practice was eventually given up and instead of a doubled cloth the first was covered by a smaller one and removed at the last course henry the third required this dessert cloth to be artistically plated so as to present pleasing designs napkins were much used in greece and italy in the time of augustus and many years after each guest brought his own as we bring our pocket handkerchiefs catullus complains of a certain asinius who had stolen his marshall brings a similar accusation against a parasite named hermogenes napkins were sometimes made of asbestos and they were thrown into a brazier to clean them but these rarities were seldom possessed by any but princes for asbestos was as expensive as jewels the constitution of st agonistus for the monastery of frontenelle mentions plush napkins to wipe the hands but they were only used before and after the repast the town of rheims was renowned in the middle ages 
for the manufacture of table linen when charles the seventh made his entrance there they presented him with napkins very rich and curious by reason of the beautiful flowered work end of section thirty four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section number thirty five of pantrophion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c pantrophion by alex soyer the servants all the opulent families had a great number of servants or slaves whose low extraction the chances of war or the parental will subjected to the caprices of the rich as a mere thing possessed a right a property they were known like the slaves of the jews in former times by their ears which were pierced with an awl an infaceable stigma which always reminded the free man of his former humiliation the slave was also often marked with a hot iron on the back the hands the cheeks or the forehead and the characters thus imprinted served the master as an evidence against his fugitive servant in whatsoever place he might find him it is perhaps similar marks that the prophet zechariah makes allusion when he says what are these wounds in thy hands platus whose comic vein respects neither the power of the gods nor the sanctity of misfortune calls these unfortunate creatures lettered slaves servus vituros a house of any note could not do without a crowd of servants to whom the steward dispenser apportioned the labor the food and the chastements in a lodge near the vestibule was was the porter osterius whose watchful eye observed every one who went in or out by day or night they made sure of his vigilance by chaining him to his place the hall atrium was guarded by an intelligent and confidential servant whose functions raised him above the other slaves the atriensis such was his designation had the care of the arms trophies precious furniture and books which adorned this apartment he had also to take extreme care of the paintings and wax figures that preserved from the motives of vanity or by a sentiment of respect and it was he who carried the images of venerated ancestors before the funeral procession of the head of the family when in his turn death had numbered him with the prognators the obstinator bought in the markets the meat fruit and delicacies necessary for the repasts the vocators carried the invitations received the guests and placed them at a table according to their rank these functions required a particular kind of urbanity with long experience on the part of the individual who fulfilled them the arrangement the keeping in order and adornment of the table couches belong exclusively to the cubicari valets these servants are mentioned in Sutinius and other ancient authors the caesars had a great number of cubicari who obeyed one particular chief the dapiferi brought the dishes into the dining room and other nomenclatures nomenclatures immediately informed the guests of the names and qualities of the things which which they were going to be served the structor arranged the dishes symmetrically the caesar carver cut up the meats to the sound of musical instruments 
of which she followed the measure. Finally, young slaves, prosatories, served the guests attentively and poured out their drink. Those chosen for this employment were fine, beardless, adolescent youths with a fresh complexion, whose long silky hair fell in curls over the shoulders. A wide ribbon which went twice round the waist confined their fine white tunic, a light graceful vestment which descended in front to the knees and behind hardly covered the hamstring, while the guests, softly reclining on their table couches, were enjoying the agreeable surprise reserved for them by an amiable and trifolon, slaves, sandy girli, attended to their sandals, and fastened them on the moment of departure. Others, fabulari, armed with fans of peacock feathers, drove away the flies and cooled the banqueting hall. The banquet terminated. Servants with torches and lanterns, adversatories, conducted their masters home, and pointed out to them the stones that might be lying in their path and with repeated libations might have prevented their visual organs from discovering. We must not admit, in this nomenclature of the principal servants of a good house, the taster, progustor, who tasted or tried the viands before the guests touched them, nor the chief steward, triclincharts, and director of the repast, who had to occupy himself with the infinity of details in the kitchen, the cellar, the pantry, the buffet, and the dining room. In living synthesis of these multiplied services, he performed them all himself. The least negligence, the slightest absence of mind on his part, would have ruined the reputation, utterly marred the sumptuous hospitality of his master. Never did the general of any army tremble under the weight of a responsibility so redoubtable. Proselytories, or cup-bearer, an officer whose duty was to fill and present the cup to the king and princes, this charge was known in Egypt, and the ancients transformed Ganymede into a cup-bearer to the gods. Charlemagne had master cup-bearers. These officers signed royal charters, and kept rank amongst the great officers of state. The head one took the title of Eusenson to the king, of master, premier, or great Eusenson. In the fifteenth century the Eusensons exercised their functions only on the coronations, marriages, and entries of kings and queens. Louis the eighteenth re-established the office of Premier Usulon. It was abolished in eighteen thirty. There was, moreover, a class of miserable, obscure, despised slaves, whose useful labors rendered them necessary, and who were treated much the same as beasts of burden. This order of subaltern servants were composed of the Leticari, they carry the elegant palaquin in which the haughty matron of the noble senator were conveyed to the banqueting hall, the stokers, focari, who cut the wood, lighted, and attended to the fires, the sweepers, scopari, whose indefatigable activity kept the apartments and furniture clean, the washers, Penticuli, with a sponge and cloth they cleaned the precious tables which adorned the conicillum or dining room. Sometimes also they had to lay the covers. This rapid sketch will enable the reader to form a sufficiently correct idea of the comfort and luxury which prevailed among the Romans, and of which the Greeks set them the example. It is hardly necessary to remark that the cupbearers, stewards, carvers, and other household officers, whose names belong to modern Europe, 
perform functions analogous to those which similar servants performed formerly in Italy, but these last were debased by the stigma of slavery and degraded by long habit, whilst the others were citizens. End of section 35. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.